um, Passion Vine chapter of the Florida Native Plant Society. Uh, this is a workshop on how to identify plants. I'm Dr. Mark Minow, and uh, we have a lot of people here today from different backgrounds. Uh, let me make clear, I'm not a botanist. So <laughs> but I've, I've, I've learned a lot of botany uh, just by talking to people and uh, on my own and uh, reading books and, uh, and, and trying to figure things out. And that, that's right, yeah, that, a, exactly. So to, to know butterflies and other things too, I mean, it's the basis of everything here that uh, we, we live with. So we have to have plants. And, uh, and there's a lot of them. Uh, if you saw my flyer that I sent out that, uh, and, and uh, Melanie sent out, uh, there's nearly 3,000 different kinds of, of native plants in Florida, plus I don't know how many thousands of other plants that we brought from all over the world. Some of those are only in gardens and places. Others have escaped and are naturalized, self-breeding. Uh, okay. That's a ton. Yeah. That's a lot. And, and, and everywhere you go, you're going to see those, too, because there, there's some really common weedy ones. Um, but uh, so there's a lot of plants out there. So it's a daunting thing. How do you where do you begin with with that kind of diversity? You know, and, and so um, I'm going to try to give you some tips on on um, how to how to figure that out. And it's easier now. You know, when I was a kid, uh, for instance, I work on butterflies and and. I had like one book on butterflies, you know, the golden guide to butterflies and moths. <laughs> Almost nobody else. I, I don't know. I, I never knew anybody else that knew anything about butterflies or, or plants for that matter, you know. Uh, and so um, so you just kind of absorb absorb that from talking to people and, and your own research and all. So. Um, so if you if you stay with it, I mean, you'll you'll gradually learn. If, if even today, if you just pick five plants and learn five plants for today, that's a good start, you know. And then you, if you can remember those, and then uh, as as you get out and look around th at things, you'll probably find other plants and, and gradually build up your your knowledge of, of the local flora here. Uh, if you put me in some other continent, some other place, I'd probably recognize some of the plants, or at least have a good idea of what family they may belong to. Uh, but um, uh, after working in Florida since 1982, I've, I've gotten to uh, be quite familiar with a lot of the plants here. So um, so let's just start with some things. I, I, I took some things off of the internet here. So uh, One is classification. Uh, how are plants and animals classified? This goes back to uh, our modern classification system goes back to uh, Carl von Linn, a Swedish botanist, uh, and, and his 10th uh, edition of his catalog. He was cataloging all of the plants in the world that he could, he could get uh, because it was so interesting, you know. Uh, and, and that was a time in the 1700s and uh, then in the 1800s, uh, you know, people were starting to move around, finding, bringing back crazy, strange things from other parts of the world, and what is this, you know? And so they needed, they needed a classification system, and he wasn't the only one. He, he was building on what they knew about at the time. And uh, I think, though, uh, he came up with our modern, uh, modern way of thinking about it, uh, and um, uh, because in the past it would be like, uh, you, know, you would describe a plant rather than give it a name. It would be like the, the big tree with broad leaves, you know, uh, this long description of a plant. Uh, and he shortened it to just two names. The first name is the genus name, and the second name is the specific epithet. And so, um, and he, he came up with this classification system, which other people and other colleagues of his was probably talking about, and he, he's the one that got credit for it, though. And um, and so we're using his 10th edition of the catalog, uh, his catalog of all the plants and animals in the world, uh, 1758, I believe it is. Uh, and so whatever he called it at that time, we're still using those names today. And, um, and, and he came up with a classification system. So uh, and it's what we call hierarchical. So it's big groups to smaller groups, smaller, smaller, smaller groups till you get to your species level. 
and, uh, and and in his time, you know, well, there were kings and queens controlling everything, right? So the natural world, uh, of course, would have kingdoms. So, and, and in his time, there were three kingdoms. Anybody guess what the three kingdoms are? Animal, animal, plant, and mineral. Remember the game? Is it plant and that's from Linnaeus's classification scheme. Now we have many more kingdoms because we've, uh, you know, been doing a lot of study in the last 300 years or so and, and uh, figuring out how things are related. You know, in the past, maybe it was just, uh, uh, how, how do you group things uh, together? You know, well, here, here are tables, picnic tables, okay? But there are many different kinds of tables same with species out there, you know, you could, you could develop a classification system about tables or anything, really, nuts and bolts or buttons or whatever. Uh, but but for, for, our, um, for our classification system, it was uh, Charles Darwin in the 1800s and, and the evolutionary uh, biologists at that time that uh, were saying, well, all, all life is related. We're all all related in some way, and 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 so we want our classification to reflect that of how things are related, and so um, uh, and I think Linnaeus probably had that idea also that uh, you know things are related to each other. They're very similar. Some are very similar. Some are very different, and they can be grouped and classified. So he had kingdoms, and then phyla, classes, orders, family genus and species we talked about. So for, for um, many things, the family level is a good level. If you can recognize what family it's in, uh, and then you can find out a lot more information that way, uh, and, um, and uh, in books and all, and we'll, we'll explore that with the botany books here. So anybody have any questions about classification? So uh, we have scientific names that have the genus, species, and then common names, uh, which are just you know common names. They don't really have any standing in, as far as science goes. But but uh, nowadays everybody wants common names because they, they feel like they're so much easier than than scientific names, and that's true to a, a large extent. And there's been a lot of um, attempts to standardize common names. In the past, it was like. Well, this book called it this, and another book called it that, and there are a lot of regional kinds of names for the same thing. Uh, so uh, there could be a lot of common names out there. So lately, uh, where there's butterflies or, or birds or whatever, there are standard lists of common names uh, to, uh, to go by uh, to, so people can understand what you're talking about. You know, you call it one common name and somebody else calls it something else. It's like, well, what are you talking about? So. Um, so uh, those are trying to be uh, standardized and, um, and made easier to, uh, to understand. Okay, so for plants, getting back to the evolutionary history of, of things and, and the classification. So um, what are the most primitive plants that we have out there? The most basic plants. Algae. Algae, algae right? And we, when we say algae, um, and I don't know a lot about algae, but... Algae is a really diverse group of things. You know, some of them are animal-like and move around. They can swim with little little swimming structures and all. And others are, you have your brown algae, red algae, blue-green algae, uh, and then you have your green algae. And, and basically, these are all tiny little things, you know, that took microscopes. And you're looking at this little green blob, and, you know, is, is this thing different from that one? A very difficult thing just to look at it because they're so difficult to see even a lot of them they're so small and uh, so it's only lately I think with uh, with all the genetic testing they're doing you know they're comparing DNA or parts of DNA from all different organisms in, in the world uh, to figure out how they're related and um, that gets us away from some problems with just looking at something so um, for instance trees well uh, there are many, many different kinds of trees. They're all, they all have wood, they all have you know, branches, they, they all look kind of the same, but they have a really different, different trees have very different uh, evolutionary histories. And so, um, um, uh, so, so the genetic testing has given us a different data set uh, to look at. It's not perfect, I don't think. And they're only looking at small sections. They're comparing 
just certain sections of, uh, of the DNA and comparing that all, all across uh, as many different organisms as they can. But um, classification these days is being totally reworked because of that. Uh, things that look very similar, you know, uh, just to look at them, and then when they look at the DNA, they go, whoa, these things are really different. And, and, uh, and so things are being moved all over the place. Uh, families are being split apart and uh, different genera are being moved around and broken up. And so uh, it's a, a very dynamic time for classification. And actually the common names may be some of the most standard names we have because the scientific names are changing all the time, it seems like, you know? But most people think, well, the scientific names, that, that's, that's forever. No, it's, it changes based on, on our, our new knowledge that we gain, and we're moving them around and making it reflect the classifications as we, as we think they are today. And so, um, so, uh, so the most primitive plants then are gonna be the green algae. Not the brown, not the red, not the blue greens, the green algae. And, um, and they're very common, they're in the lake here, they're all kinds of different places. You, you know them, you've seen them. Um, but there's also um, other primitive plants are uh, mosses, right? Mm -hmm. We could look around here probably and see some mosses maybe growing on the trunk of the tree on the shady side or in wet places you're gonna have mosses um, and, and ferns and uh, other kinds of related plants. None of those produce seeds. Those all produce spores, tiny little propagules that blow away in the wind and start new, new plants somewhere. So they have a very different reproductive biology. And then there are the seed plants. And, uh, and so, uh, and you know these better than the other ones probably because uh, the other ones tend to be small uh, and uh, just aren't noticed much by people or compared much by people. So for the bigger ones um, in the seed plants, what do we have? The primitive ones are, um, are the gymnosperms. These are the cone-bearing plants, uh, pine trees, and, uh, and um, cycads. Uh, we have some, some cycads growing in here probably in the garden. Um, and then you have the flowering plants, which is the biggest group. And so, um, so it, if you can recognize, is it a moss, is it a liverwort, is it a fern? And we're gonna, on our walk today, take a look at some of those to try to recognize some of this and how they reproduce to put them in the right group and, and then try to find out about them, uh, some information. Any questions about that, the, these big groups of things? I have a question. Yeah. If they spread by spores, does that make them a junior little digital fungus? Uh, no. Uh, they're not. Uh, fungus, actually, they're finding are, are very animal-like. Yeah. You know, they're, the, the um, uh, <laughs> mushrooms, for instance, have chitin in it. That's the, that's the exoskeleton of insects is made of chitin. And I so... Just, uh, they're, they're the only other, you know, plant material that I think that spreads by spores. I hadn't thought of these plants spreading by spores. Yeah, they have, they have a similar... Well, spore like they have spores also, yeah, but they're derived differently also from the way the plants derive their spores. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I would say the the, the uh, fungus uh, kingdom is more closely related to animals than plants, probably. Mm -hmm. So, um, of course, plants are are green. They're producing their own food through photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. um, and um, mushrooms don't do that either. Um, Okay, let's look at some quick anatomy of plants, and I'm going to grab a plant over here. Okay, here's a good one to start with. So we have, anybody know what it is? Pepperweed, Lepidium virginicum is the scientific name, in the cabbage family, and tiny little flowers here, and we're gonna look at the flower structure later. Because what Linnaeus, going back to Linnaeus and his ideas on how to classify things, he noticed that, um, well, the leaves can change and, you know, um, but the flower structure 
was seemed to be the key to classifying plants. How the flowers were arranged, uh, how the male and female parts in the flowers were arranged and all that kind of stuff uh, seemed to be, um, there was a common thread there uh, linking uh, related plants together. And so uh, all of his classification was based on the flower structure. Um, so, uh, so this plant is in the cabbage family. They used to be called crucifers, uh, the, the family, but that means cross-bearing. If you see I-F-E-R at the end of the scientific name, it means bearing. So honeybees are Apis mellifera, meaning honey-bearing. Uh, sponges are uh, porifera, meaning pore-bearing. And, uh, and so these are the cross-bearers because the flowers have four petals that make a cross. And so, um, so and that, that's an old term. We've uh, changed that. We've gotten rid of cru crucifers. Uh, and uh, now we have the name Brassicaceae for these because our modern rules say uh, you have to have some plant that, uh, that, that the, the names reflect. And so uh, Brassica was the first name uh, in this family. And so Brassica uh, is in the family name Brassicaceae. All the family names in plants and animals have the same ending. Plants end in A-C-E-A-E. Uh, so Brassicaceae, and animals end in I-D-A-E, so uh, Pyridae is an example. So you can tell by the ending uh, uh, whether it's a family or not, uh, and I um, hope this isn't too confusing for you. There's so much to talk about with these things. So basic plant structure. We have roots and we have shoots. Right? Roots and shoots. The roots uh, go from bigger to smaller to smaller to fine, very fine root hairs, they call them, tiny little extensions. Often the roots are um, uh, infected or coated with, uh, with uh, fungus, some kind of fungus in the soil that helps them gather minerals and water. And, um, and those are very important, uh, especially in sandy soils like we have here. Um, the, uh, the shoots, uh, and you can tell it's a shoot if there's a, you look for buds. If there's a bud somewhere on here, which is going to produce a leaf or a flower, that's a shoot. And, uh, and then the leaves are attached. I can pull this off. And uh, so usually there's a stalk. Um, and in this one, the, le the leaf blade goes down the stalk. The stalk is called the petiole, and so that's the attachment of the leaf to the stem. The leaves may be alternately arranged like they are in here. There's one down here, and then there's one up here, another one over here. Or they may be uh, opposite, uh, where they're directly across from each other. There aren't there many plants that have opposite leaves, so they're often, if you see one with opposite leaves, you can pro probably guess what, what group it's going to be in. Um, and then at the tips here are flowers and seeds. They're on little stalks also, attaching them to the, to the stem. So now we have our quiz. Oh boy. Here's an onion, right? So what is this? Is that a... A root or a shoot? A root. Okay, well, the roots were down here, right? Oh, so it's, miss, it's kind of missing the roots, but that's where the roots were attached. <laughs> and this is a dry one, but normally you would see the green leaves coming out. Those would be the leaves. And um, so if we cut down through here and take a look at this. So the stem is actually right there where the roots are attached. And you would see green leaves coming out of here. This fleshy stuff here is actually the bases of leaves that wrap around each other and attach to the stem down here. That's the stem. So we had roots and a shoot, and all of this is leaf bases inside here. So is that a stem? 
The stem is only this tiny part right here. Uh -huh. So it's the leaf, the whole thing. So you, you These are all leaves. So that's considered leaves. Yeah. Yes, okay. those are leaves. <laughs> How about a carrot? That's a leaf. Root. I'm not making any assumptions <laughs> anymore. <laughs> Root. So we had the leaves, I couldn't find one with leaves on it, but the leaves would be coming out of here, so uh, the stem would be here, and that, that would grow up when it's getting ready to flower and produce the flower, so the stem would be up here, and this was the root. So this is a tap root, right? Yep. Uh, for storage, it's storing carbohydrates and other things that the plant needs to flower. And uh, things like grasses usually have a fibrous root system, just little, really fine roots, not a really thick root like this. In Florida soils, uh, thick roots like this are pretty common on things. If you've ever dug up a Smilax or yeah. all kinds of things have, have a really thick tap root to store nutrients because the sand just washes everything away. Yeah. How about the potato? Root or shoot? Here, these are buds, right? Yeah. These are buds. This is a stem, an underground storage stem we call a potato. So these will produce shoots off. These are the nodes or the, bu the buds here uh, that'll produce more shoots coming out. So this is actually a stem. So you call them stem vegetables, not root vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> and what are they thinking? I know. <laughs> okay. Yeah. In fact, if you want a butterfly garden with carrots, just buy a pack of carrots at the store and plant it, and it'll it'll grow. Most of them will grow new tops and maybe flower for you too. But rather, only rather, greens, not more carrots. It'll go to seed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm thinking of the butterflies that eat the leaves oh, yeah, of, the, yeah, yeah. Um, the of the plant. Carrot. Right. Yeah. Because growing them from seed takes a while, you know. You can just go to the grocery store and buy a bunch of carrots and. and but have then carrots. That, that would be like potatoes. You can grow more potatoes from a potato. Yes, you can cut that potato into pieces, and that's how they do it, yeah. and grow new new it's potatoes. Potato. Okay, let me just get my notes together here for a second. So, um, so parts of the flower. You might be able to see this from back there. Okay, so the flowers on flowering plants are the reproductive structures, right? There's a stalk. This is called the pedicel. You know, botany has such a, a, a huge vocabulary with it. Uh, so you, you kind of have to know some of these terms to, to work with the uh, identification guides and all. So it has a stalk, that's the pedicel. It has a pair of bracts or some bracts here. Um, which are the sepals. You have petals, which are the, the colored parts here that, that, that attract uh, butterflies and pollinators. And then inside of those, you have the reproductive parts. So you have the stamens, the male part of the flower, producing the pollen, the anthers, um, and then the, this big column area here is the female part. So this is cut in half, so you see down inside here where the seeds will develop in the ovary. Um, the kind of base of it is the receptacle. And some, some flowers, um, you know, how these are attached, uh, sometimes the, the ovaries down below here, and this one's up above, sometimes the receptacle grows around the ovary. Uh, in fact, we're gonna look at an example of that. So what has to happen uh, is the pollen from the uh, anthers here has to get onto the tip of the, this column, the stigma, they call that, right? This is a sticky, a sticky place, this female part. The, the pollen grains stick to it. Pollen grains have two cells, I think. Uh, the first cell grows a tube. Uh, when it lands on this, this stigma, it grows a tube down into the ovary and the second cell in there is the sperm cell, and it goes down the tube and fertilizes the ovary. Isn't that weird? 
Now, uh, some of them are bisexual like this. They have both male and, most of them have male and female parts in the same flower. Some uh, plants like persimmons, there's persimmons down here, they are either male or female flowers. And some of them, um, the, the uh, pollen from the same flower is incompatible. It won't grow. Uh, they have to have pollen from a different plant that will grow on the stigma. And this is all to increase diversity, right? Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at this then. An apple. So we have the stem, the mm -hmm. pedicel. The other end of the, where the flower was. Mm -hmm. And these are still sepals. Maybe there's even some anthers or something left in there. If I cut it in half and we look at it, so the seeds are in the middle here, right? And it's surrounded by this fleshy part. This is all the receptacle. So that bottom part that I showed in the diagram is actually expanded and encased the ovary of the plant into this fleshy part, protecting uh, the seeds and all inside. So this, this is the ovary inside. Talk about trees for a minute since they're big they're giant right uh, and trees um, first of all so they're they're taking water up by the roots and uh, you know they're not they're not like us they don't have a real circulation system they're they're moving uh, water up in special tubes called xylem and the leaves are producing uh, sugars through photosynthesis a green color chlorophyll is helping produce uh, sugars and those are going to the rest of the plant through tubes called phloem cells. So phloem is going down, water is coming up through the xylem and um, the leaves also have holes in the bottom uh, through which gases can come in and out because they have to have oxygen to do the photosynthesis thing, right? They have to have gas exchange. So there are little holes in the bottoms of the leaves. You could maybe see that with a, a magnifying glass, and I have one here uh, we can look at. Uh, and um, and the water, the water is going up into there, and it's evaporating out of there. Um, and and that's pulling pulling water up from the roots. There's also some root pressure down there too from um, uh, sugars and other uh, things that are helping to uh, kind of push push water up. But water, water is sticky, you know, it sticks to stuff. It's one of the most interesting qualities of it. And so, uh, so the water molecules are, are sticking together in these tiny tubes. And so, but there's a maximum level. It's about, I don't know how many feet, how tall is the tallest root sequoia tree? <laughs> uh, I think it's about 300 feet, isn't it? Something like 300 feet is uh, the maximum uh, you can get water movement through those tiny tubes from roots to the tip of a leaf. Uh, and beyond that, it just doesn't work anymore. So that you can't, you, that's about as tall as trees can get. Well, it's one of the factors uh, in, in um, uh, yeah, because you would think the smaller trees would have a much easier time you know, with everything and moving water up and moving food around in the tree and everything. Uh, but when we look at this diagram, so uh, so we have the bark on the outside, of course, that's dead, dead cells. And the wood inside is dead also. Uh, the only living part of a tree is the area just under the bark. Uh, and and if you, you know, if you nick it, you'll see it's green or something in there. Uh, that, that's the only living part. So now if I pound a nail in here, uh, down below here and come back in 10 years, is the nail going to be up here? Nope. No, the nail's not going to move, right? Because plants don't grow that way. They grow from the tips of the shoots and they increase in girth because this is a living layer on the outside of this wood uh, trunk here underneath the bark. So it's adding girth down below here, and all the growth is from the tips of the shoots. 
on the tree. So the nail's not going to go anywhere. It's, it's there. Um, I don't know. Any other questions about trees? Wood? No. Uh, let me just have a couple of things about grasses and all. Um, so grasses, um, their, their leaves clasp the stem. That's called a sheath. So you have a leaf blade here and a, a collar area that has some special structures we'll look at. And then the rest of it wraps around. That's the sheath. And uh, there's some important structures there too. Their flowers are really pretty different from regular flowering plants in that the flowers are encased in bracts called uh, glooms. So there's a little bract here, a little bract here, and the flowers are deep inside of that. Uh, and so um, you have to kind of pull them apart to see the parts in there to understand the, the keys uh, to, to actually identify them. Um, there's a lot of other information here. We can go later. But so this book by uh, Dick Wonderland and, and Bruce Hansen at University of South Florida, over by Tampa. Um, you know, UF had, had a, a bunch of botanists. Dan Ward was there for years. Um, Dana Griffin, um, Walter Judd. These are famous botanists. And there's a whole bunch of molecular scientists working there. The Soltises, Doug and Pam Soltises, doing all the genetic testing now. And, um, and then there was um, some other people up at uh, in Ta Tallahassee universities there. And they didn't talk to each other pretty you know, much. They kind of all did their own separate thing. So there, there wasn't any real comprehensive work on Florida plants. They all did like regional things, you know, plants of central Florida, plants of the Panhandle, plants of South Florida, uh, until Dick Wonderland uh, and with, with Bruce and other people at, at the University of South Florida uh, said, you know, this is ridiculous. Let's, let's do a whole uh, flora, a whole uh, guide to Florida plants. And so uh, they've been amazing at this. Not only did they produce, I don't know, several different editions of this book. 11? Uh, 11? So. This is third edition. This is the third edition. Okay, <laughs> okay. Third, I think there's three, or maybe they have a fourth edition, I don't know. But their, their main um, important contribution now has been online, at the Atlas of Florida Plants. What an amazing site this is. It, it's got all kinds of things except the keys, the, the dichotomous keys, we're gonna talk about that in a minute, to actually identify plants. It has all the names and all the information about the names. It has um, uh, maps, distribution maps in Florida by county. Uh, it has uh, photos of them, which is something we would really like to have. This is something that's been missing. In fact, you won't find a, a, a photo or a diagram in this book, uh, hardly. I think there's a couple maybe in the beginning which makes it really difficult to understand what the heck are they talking about, <laughs> you know? It's, it's uh, in this botanical terms. Uh, but theoretically, you should be able to identify every plant in Florida with this book, with the information in this book. And two, two things with the atlas, I think they're adding keys because they do oh, add that would be, some plants. That would be phenomenal. Plants. Yeah. And the other cool thing that I find useful is they yeah. have the pictures of the voucher plants. Yeah. Because that's the only resource you have for seeing what the root structure is. You're right. Mm -hmm. So they've taken their, their pressed specimens, the herbarium sheets they call this, and photographed them. And those are all online. Mm -hmm. And you can go and look at it, you know, and there, you can do a close-up of it too. It's a, a little bit closer. Um, and so uh, that's what's missing from this book. What does it even look like? You know, which is, a, and a lot of times the flower color are all, which is often really important, it's not even mentioned in here. So uh, there is a lot of information here though, you know, uh, theoretically you can get to a species and it, it tells you whether it's native or not, where, where it occurs, is it rare or common, uh, that kind of stuff. And so this is a ph phenomenal book uh, to accompany the website. 
but I'll go to the website and uh, if I can recognize the family or maybe something else about it, the genus or something, I can go pull that up and look at photos and go, oh yeah, it's this one, and look at the range maps. It's like, oh, well, this doesn't occur in Alachua County. It's only in South Florida. Well, it's probably this one, you know, and, and kind of guess my way through it to figure it out. Um, but uh, so we were going to key something out in here. Is that okay? Do you want to try that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the way the book is arranged, first of all, in the back, there's a, a quick index to all the families. So if you know a family, you can go here and go, okay, uh, the, um, the Gelsimiaceae is on page 465. So I don't have to look through all the, the index, which is very lengthy, to try to find that. I can get, go there immediately and find it. Also in the back area here is a glossary. So when they talk about some botanical term that you've never heard of, you can go to the glossary and here's a, a very nice description of all the terms that they use in this book, which is extremely useful. Uh, sometimes I have to follow up on this too on, and Google it <laughs> to get more information on what are they talking about here, you know. Uh, and, and, um, but but uh, th this glossary is, is very, very um, uh, useful. So, um, I saw a little flower over here. We're going to try this. flower. Let's give this a try with our book. Does anybody want to see the flower? Okay, let me read it as you and you, you guys will help me with this. Okay, so it goes, uh, there's some introductory keys. The keys are really uh, the first algorithms. You know, they talk about algorithms all the time that uh, identify you and what your preferences are online and stuff. So every time you buy a fishing rod, uh, it's going to go, oh, and it links it with other information, the computer. So, oh, this is a white male. He's buying a fishing rod. He's probably going to be interested in fishing stuff, you know, so maybe boots or lures or something pop up. Uh, well, it's the same technology that was in this book. So a, a key is a, um, a description uh, of, in a way to figure out what you have. So it gives you, a dichotomous key gives you two choices. And they're numbered here. Now, I, I had a professor on my graduate committee, uh, Dr. Dale Hobbeck, and he had a great quote about this. Dichotomous keys are written by people who don't need them for people who can't use them. And it's so true because the people that wrote this book, they know all these plants practically by heart. They can, and they have a whole collection that they can go and pull out specimens and go, oh yeah, it's this one here. You can't do that. You only have their descriptions in here. And it can be very difficult because maybe it's asking for a flower and you don't have a flower, you have leaves, or maybe a fruit. You don't have a fruit, you have flowers. And, and it can be really frustrating at times, but theoretically, if you have all that, you should be able to get through this and figure it out. Um, so let's start here with this little flower that we just picked off of the, um, and you can hold it for me, please, or somebody can hold it. So first we're gonna go, it says major vascular plant groups. Vascular plants mean they have uh, those vascular systems to move water and, um, and uh, sugars around in the plant. So you're not going to find um, mosses or uh, this starts with ferns and things like that in here. No, no mosses in here, but the atlas does have mosses now. Okay, so plant reproducing by spores. Yes or no? No. no, we have flowers. It's a flowering plant, not a spore-bearing plant. Okay. Um, oh my gosh. Okay, so here we go. 
leaves with a single mid vein. I'd say yes. Uh, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Going to read this? Okay. Leaves with a single mid vein or with simple or sometimes dichotomously branched veins. These closely parallel. Does it have parallel veins? We didn't talk about this yet because flowering plants, there are two main I'd groups. I'd say so, but you have to. Uh, it's, it, it's not. It's branching not? from a main stem. Okay. So if parallel, they would all be going the same direction. Okay. And, um, and if that was true, you would have um, the, um, well, uh, the first one here, it's, uh, 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 it's the gymnosperms, pines and uh, th those kinds of plants. It's not, it's not that, right? So this has the cross veins and all on it. So it's, we're going to the second thing here. Uh, so the um, the par it doesn't have the parallel veins. It has the other ones. It's it's going to be a dicotyledon. So when the seed first germinates and comes out of the ground, it has two two first seed leaves. Those are called the cotyledons, the first leaves from the seed. You can think of a bean, a bean seed like this. When the embryo starts growing into roots and shoots. The, the two halves of the bean come out. Those are the cotyledons, and they turn green, and they become the first leaves of the plant. That's shown right here, these first leaves, the cotyledons. So in the monocots, the ones with the parallel venation, there's only one seed leaf. But in the dicots, there are two, like in the beans. And they have a branching kind of venation, like, like it's shown here. So this has the branching venation. This is a dicot. Okay. Uh, we're going to go to page 240 in here. Hold on. Uh-oh. We're not going to answer that. <laughs> Here's the, here's the dicots. Um, so, uh, are the petals present or absent? They're present, right? Yeah. Okay. Are the um, petals uh, united or free? Are they stuck together? At least at the base? They are, right? Yes. I think they might be. I think they are. I think they're stuck together. So we go to key three here. Wow. You know, there's so many families in here. I don't know if it's worth your time <laughs> to go through all this, this key and try to figure this out. You know, Mark, you're not making uh, this look any easier. Than <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's not, it's not easy. It's not easy to use these things. It takes study to figure yeah. out what they're talking about in the keys right. and practice with them. And so the easiest way is to Call ask Mark. somebody, ask, ask somebody <laughs> that Mark, knows. Send you a picture. Yes, <laughs> that, <laughs> that is the easiest way to figure it out. And nowadays, I mean, they've taken that online with yeah. iNaturalist. Yeah. If you don't know what it is, you take a picture of it, you send it to iNaturalist, and they'll identify it for yes. you. Or the Atlas will also will also do that for you. Is this a cyta? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it's it's called fan petals, and so yeah. Are you sure those leaves are fused at the base? Because I the, thought the petals? The, the petals will overlap like a fan. Uh, I can't quite tell here, and I'm in front of everybody, so it's a little crazy. I'll edit I it think out, they, don't worry. I think they are free. <laughs> Now that I pull it apart, they're, yeah, free. they're free. They're free because they overlap. That's yes. why it's called fan petals. Yes, very good, John. So, uh, so that's so a cyta acuta. 
or no, no, it's one of the others. Yes, and it's in the hibiscus family, the Malvaceae, which uh, if you think about hibiscuses, they uh, usually have uh, pretty petals, uh, and there's a lot of stamens in here. You can see the stamens. All, all are based around the, the, uh, the female part in there. So uh, maybe if we see some other hibiscuses, you can s see how different Caesar the weed. plant looks like. Yeah, oh, that's right, we have Caesar weed here. <laughs> we'll look at some other ones and see yeah, and compare uh, with this one, and you'll see maybe s some similarities there with that family. Okay. So, Mark, your book looks so new. Are, are you one of those people that doesn't use it? No, I use that all the time. Okay. Uh, also, uh, you know, there's so many books now available. Uh, so picture booking is another way to identify it. So you just take a wildflower guide like this one from uh, Walter Kingsley Taylor, and you go through and he has it by color section. These are white flowers, yellow flowers, purple flowers. And you just kind of leaf through here and uh, go, oh, oh, I think it's this one, you know? And, um, and at least to get a genus on it, in, or a family, and then you can use the key more readily, I think, to actually figure out which one you have, as well as the atlas, and look at other pictures of other species on there. So, uh, so these, I'll put these out here. These are great uh, books. Uh, Gil Nelson has ones on trees and, and vines. Um, King, Walter Taylor has a bunch. Um, Here's one on grasses, uh, published by the Native Plant Society, I think. Um, oops, David Hall. Um, mm. He produced this beautiful book, again, all co color. Uh, David was a, a he, he worked his entire life as a botanist, so he was in high demand for wetland plant surveys to identify grasses and things. That was his forte was grasses and sedges, which can be very difficult to identify. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, he, he had a book. And um, Roger Hammer has uh, a number of books for South Florida. Beautiful photographs in here. Roger's phenomenal. He's won all kinds of awards for his books. Uh, and uh, just knowledge. Plus, he gives all kinds of other information about the names and, of, of the plants and, and what maybe medicinal qualities and stuff in here. Uh, these are great books. And just uh, Wendy Zomlifer, she was at UF uh, for uh, many years, and she's produced this uh, beautiful drawings and descriptions of plant families. Uh, and so um, you can look through here and kind of see how they, you know, how they compare. Mark, you recommended that to me. Oh, okay. Did Five years it? ago, I got it online for like twelve dollars. Yes, a used cheap. copy. Yeah. And they're new; they're expensive, but it's it's my go-to book for so practically everything. She's great, phenomenal, fantastic. Okay, uh, so maybe we'll take a little break if you need to use the restroom or get a drink, and then we're going to go wander around and look at stuff.